tell God all of my troubles when I get home. Hello and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by G.K. Jeffers and Peter Adamson. Brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Lifting the Veil, Introducing W.E.B. Du Bois. Once upon a time in Berlin, on a presumably cold February evening in 1893, an American student celebrated his 25th birthday. Alone in his room, he conducted an idiosyncratic little ritual involving Greek wine, candles, and oil. Later on, reflecting on the mysteries of existence, he wrote in his notebook, Oh, I wonder what I am. I wonder what the world is. I wonder if life is worth the striving. I do not know. Perhaps I shall never know. But this I do know. Be the truth what it may, I shall seek it, on the pure assumption that it is worth seeking. And heaven nor hell, God nor devil, shall turn me from my purpose till I die. It's an admirable profession of faith in truth-seeking as a vocation, fitting for a man who is widely considered one of the great philosophical minds of American history. That he would eventually be perceived this way, acclaimed as a major figure not just in philosophy but in all of the humanities and the social sciences, would have pleased the young William Edward Burghardt Du Bois, best known as W.E.B. Du Bois. On that same February night, back in 1893, he wrote in his diary, these are my plans, to make a name in science, to make a name in literature, and thus to raise my race. He was nothing if not ambitious, from his youth through the rest of his life, and he made good on that ambition. Arguably, Du Bois did more to raise his race over the course of his life than any other black public intellectual active at the same time as him. We've mentioned Du Bois numerous times, but this is the first episode we will devote primarily to his life and thought, though not the last. Du Bois is typically viewed as a 20th century figure, and with good reason, as he had been active as a leader and thinker for almost two-thirds of that century when he died in 1963. But he was born in 1868, and so came of age in the 19th century. Some of his most lasting contributions actually date back to the 1890s. This episode then, which will help us wrap up part two of our series, will introduce Du Bois by discussing his rise as a scholar in the 19th century. Du Bois was born in Great Barrington in western Massachusetts. Raised by a single mother, he showed an early aptitude for learning and academic achievement. During his teen years, while excelling in school, he also pursued an interest in journalism, becoming a local correspondent for a couple of newspapers, including the New York Globe, edited by none other than T. Thomas Fortune. From high school, he moved on to Fisk University, a black college in Nashville, Tennessee. This was a magical time for Du Bois, coming as he did from a small, predominantly white town in the north. Fisk placed him within a much larger black world. It is here that he first developed a love for philosophy, which he would take with him to Harvard after completing his first degree at Fisk. During his time at Harvard, some of the biggest names in the history of American philosophy taught there, people like William James, Josiah Royce, and George Santayana. Du Bois took William James, in particular, as a mentor. Yet James suggested to Du Bois that he should refrain from pursuing professional philosophy as a career option. Before jumping to the conclusion that this must have been a case of racist gatekeeping, it should be noted that Du Bois, who could be very sensitive to perceived slights, never once indicated that he saw anything malicious in James advising him that, if you can turn aside into something else, do so, for it is hard to earn a living with philosophy. To the contrary, we get the sense that Du Bois appreciated James's advice, and that he never regretted diverting his path from, to use his words, the lovely but sterile land of philosophic speculation, in order to take up instead the social sciences for gathering and interpreting that body of fact which would apply to my program for the Negro. Does this mean that Du Bois should not be characterized as a philosopher? No, as we can see from another comment he made on his change of path, I conceived the idea of applying philosophy to an historical interpretation of race relations. Even without this clarification that his aim was to combine philosophy with social science, we would still have his body of writing, so philosophically rich that it banishes any doubt. After graduating and receiving his second bachelor's degree, Du Bois did a master's degree in history at Harvard. During this time, he heard about an opportunity 
being offered by the John F. Slater Fund for the Education of Negroes, pledging support for study in Europe to a worthy candidate. Presiding over the fund at the time was Rutherford B. Hayes, former president of the United States, and incidentally the one whose controversial election had led to the end of Reconstruction. Hayes expressed doubt that anyone suitable for the fellowship could be found. When Du Bois applied and was told that the plan had been given up, he wrote back in anger, calling the withdrawal of the opportunity an almost irreparable injury to the race I represent and am not ashamed of. His boldness paid off. Hayes told Du Bois to reapply the following year, which he did. He sailed for Europe in the summer of 1892. Du Bois's time in Europe was life-changing, in a way similar to his time at Fisk, as it broadened him and made him feel part of a larger world, in this case, actually, the whole world. He studied at the University of Berlin, or the Friedrich Wilhelms Universität, as it was called officially at that time. Gustav Schmoller, a leading economist of the time, supervised Du Bois' thesis on agriculture in the American South. The young American who celebrated his 25th birthday with those ambitious notebook writings was as prepared as he could be to attain the prestige of a PhD from the foremost German university, and at a time when German higher education was the most respected in the world. Unfortunately, the Slater Fund denied him the financial support he needed for an additional semester of study before he could be allowed to defend his thesis, so Du Bois had to come home and settle for becoming the first black person to obtain a PhD from Harvard. His doctoral dissertation expanded on work he had done for his master's thesis. In 1896, the year after he finished, the dissertation was published as a book, entitled The Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States of America, 1638 to 1870. It was the first volume in the Harvard Historical Studies book series, a new venture in the early days of university-sponsored publishing. The book displayed Du Bois's skill as a historian, tracing the evolving role of the slave trade in American political and economic life and the successes and failures of attempts at abolition. In a connection to topics we have ourselves covered here on the podcast, it featured a chapter called Toussaint Louverture and Anti-Slavery Effort, 1787 to 1806. Here, Du Bois argued that the Haitian Revolution played a significant role in shaping the legal suppression of the slave trade to the United States and the American debate over the abolition of slavery. Recall also that Anna Julia Cooper later made the Haitian Revolution central to her own historical dissertation, which made her the first black woman to gain a PhD from the Sorbonne. This underscores something we've seen many times, the importance of that revolution as an inspiring event for African American thinkers. Du Bois got his first job at Wilberforce University, a black college in southwestern Ohio affiliated with the AME Church. His appointment was in classics, but he taught not just Greek and Latin, but also German, English, and history. An anecdote from his time there is indicative of Du Bois's complicated relationship with religion. He wandered into a prayer meeting, and the student leading it announced that Professor Du Bois will lead us in prayer, to which Du Bois quickly responded, No, he won't. The quip nearly lost him his job, for it apparently took a great deal of explaining to the Board of Bishops why a professor in Wilberforce should not be able at all times and sundry to address God in extemporaneous prayer. During his time at Wilberforce, he also met Nina Gomer, a student at the university who became his wife. In 1896, the same year they were married, the couple left Wilberforce for Philadelphia. The reason for the departure is that Du Bois accepted an offer of temporary employment by the University of Pennsylvania, not to teach, but to carry out a study of Philadelphia's Seventh Ward, an impoverished area of the city in which a large portion of its black population lived. Excited to finally focus his energies on sociology, which he could not do while at Wilberforce, Du Bois literally went door to door, personally interviewing thousands of people in order to obtain as clear and as comprehensive a picture as possible of the conditions and characteristics of the area's inhabitants. The resulting book, The Philadelphia Negro, was published in 1899. It has increasingly been recognized as part of the pioneering work that made Du Bois an early founder of the field of sociology as we know it. As 1899 brings us to the end of the century that is our focus in this episode, we will now step back a bit from there to focus on what Du Bois accomplished in 1897, truly an annus mirabilis. In March of that year, Du Bois visited Washington, D.C., 
to attend the first meeting of the American Negro Academy, which was organized by Alexander Crummel. Du Bois first met Crummel when he gave a commencement address a few years prior at Wilberforce. He would later write of that first encounter, Instinctively, I bowed before this man as one bows before the prophets of the world. At the meeting of the American Negro Academy, Du Bois delivered a paper entitled The Conservation of Races, which has since become his single most influential writing within the field of philosophy. While in D.C., he also met with the federal government's Bureau of Labor Statistics to discuss producing studies of African-American economic progress. As a result of this successful interview, Du Bois left Philadelphia to spend July and August doing sociological research in Farmville, Virginia. The final result, called The Negroes of Farmville, Virginia, a Social Study, serves as a sort of counterpart to the Philadelphia Negro, complementing the study of African Americans in the urban north in that book with a study of the rural south and pointing out connections between the two. For example, he claims that children and the elderly make up a larger proportion of the population in a place like Farmville, in part because of the migration to the north of married couples without their children. As a result, the family in Farmville is the complement of the Negro family in a city like Philadelphia, and these two families are very often but parts of one family. August of 1897 was also the month in which Du Bois first reached a wider non-academic reading public with his writing through an article published in The Atlantic Monthly entitled Strivings of the Negro People. This was later revised to become the first chapter of his 1903 book, The Souls of Black Folk. In that form, it would ultimately become his most influential, most often quoted, and most widely discussed piece of writing. He would certainly have been entitled to call it a year and have a rest during autumn, but he still had one more seminal contribution in him. In November, he presented a paper entitled The Study of the Negro Problems at the annual meeting of the American Academy of Political and Social Science which took place in Philadelphia. This, too, has come to be recognized as one of his classic works. And the year was momentous in other ways, too. He became a father in October to a son named Burghardt. In December, he, Nina, and Burghardt moved to Atlanta, where he would begin employment in the new year at a black college called Atlanta University, today known as Clark Atlanta University. This would be his institutional home for the rest of his career as a college professor, although, as we'll see in future episodes, much of his career was spent working outside the university. Having surveyed his wondrous productivity in 1897, we can now look more closely at the three most important philosophical writings of that year, The Conservation of Races, Strivings of the Negro People, and The Study of the Negro Problems. We'll take the last first, given that the other two essays are both more famous and closely linked to one another. The Study of the Negro Problems, can be understood as a kind of sociological manifesto, in which Du Bois argues that this discipline, still in its infancy, will grow toward being a real science by attending to the problems involved in the presence of black people in America. He defines a social problem as the failure of an organized social group to realize its group ideals through the inability to adapt a certain desired line of action to given conditions of life. He discusses the role of slavery in the origin of the social problems involving African Americans and makes recommendations for how the study of these problems should proceed. An aspect of the essay that has gained attention in recent years is Du Bois's philosophy of science. He writes, Students must be careful to insist that science as such, be it physics, chemistry, psychology, sociology, has but one simple aim, the discovery of truth. Its results lie open for the use of all men, merchants, physicians, men of letters, and philanthropists, but the aim of science itself is simple truth. Any attempt to give it a double aim, to make social reform the immediate instead of the immediate object of a search for truth, will inevitably tend to defeat both objects. This is an interesting and somewhat paradoxical position. Consider that Du Bois also claims that, the sole aim of any society is to settle its problems in accordance with its highest ideals, and the only rational method of accomplishing this is to study those problems in the light of the best scientific research. This means that social reform is, in one sense, the purpose of scientific research, yet Du Bois argues that scientific research can only be successful if scientists force themselves to ignore that purpose of what they are doing. In a study of Du Bois's philosophy of science, Liam Kofi Bright, has explained that for Du Bois, 
public trust in scientists is essential if their research is to aid social reform within a democracy. This public trust, he suggests, is best secured if scientists are perceived as having no other goal than seeking the truth, and no investment in particular forms of social reform. If the study of the Negro problems has just recently come to be seen as relevant to debates in the philosophy of science, the conservation of races has long been recognized as centrally important to debates in the philosophy of race. Kwame Anthony Appiah's critical interpretation of Du Bois's essay in his 1985 article, The Uncompleted Argument, Du Bois and the Illusion of Race, sparked an ongoing debate about whether Du Bois helps us understand racial difference as a social rather than biological reality. Du Bois argues that physical differences cannot be used to consistently sort human beings into discrete, non-arbitrary groupings that we can call races. Still, he claims that races, while they perhaps transcend scientific definition, nevertheless are clearly defined to the eye of the historian and sociologist. In other words, races are not natural, but socio-historical in origin. Du Bois defines a race as a vast family of human beings, generally of common blood and language, always of common history, traditions, and impulses, who are both voluntarily and involuntarily striving together for the accomplishment of certain more or less vividly conceived ideals of life. This definition makes race a fundamentally social phenomenon. Note that common blood is only generally involved, whereas common history is always at stake. The passage also reveals that race, in Du Bois's eyes, is a matter of cultural continuity, as implied by his talk of traditions and ideals of life. Du Bois goes on to argue that races, by striving for ideals of life, advance civilization. There are, according to him, eight major races in the world in the socio-historical sense of the term. The Slavs of Eastern Europe, the Teutons of Middle Europe, the English of Great Britain and America, the Romance nations of Southern and Western Europe, the Negroes of Africa and America, the Semitic people of Western Asia and Northern Africa, the Hindus of Central Asia, and the Mongolians of Eastern Asia. In his broad retelling of the history of races, some of these groups have distinctive contributions for which they can be recognized. The English nation stood for constitutional liberty and commercial freedom, the German nation for science and philosophy, the Romance nation stood for literature and art. By contrast, the black race has clearly not yet finished giving to modern civilization its full spiritual message. He begins the essay by acknowledging that African Americans are sometimes tempted to downplay racial difference in reaction to racist denigration. In light of the task of bringing the black gift to the world's table, though, African Americans have a duty to embrace their distinctive character as members of the global black race, hence the value of conserving the race, as mentioned in the title of the essay. Du Bois seems to have been directly influenced by Anna Julia Cooper in articulating this ideal. In the chapter of her book, A Voice from the South, entitled, Has America a Race Problem? If so, how can it best be solved? Cooper claims that different races specialize in different forms of life, in order to bring about a divinely ordered perfection. As she puts it, each race has its badge, its exponent, its message, branded in its forehead by the great master's hand, which is its own peculiar keynote and its contribution to the harmony of the world. Still earlier thinkers likely influenced them both, such as the German philosopher Johann Gottfried von Herder, but enough recognizable words and themes are echoed in Du Bois that direct influence from Cooper is a safe bet. Another important part of the conservation of races is Du Bois's articulation of a dilemma that African Americans face when thinking about whether or not racial difference is something to embrace or downplay. He writes, No Negro who has given earnest thought to the situation of his people in America has failed at some time in life to find himself at these crossroads, has failed to ask himself at some time, what after all am I? Am I an American or am I a Negro? Can I be both? Or is it my duty to cease to be a Negro as soon as possible and be an American? If I strive as a Negro, am I not perpetuating the very cleft that threatens and separates black and white America? If you already knew just one thing about Du Bois, it's likely the fact that he drew attention to this psychological phenomenon. His name is today strongly associated with a phrase that he uses to label it in Strivings of the Negro People, double consciousness. We do not find that exact phrase here in The Conservation of Races, but we do find the concept, or to be more accurate, 
the closely related concept of two-ness. As Robert Gooding Williams has pointed out, the three seminal essays of 1897 ask a series of related philosophical questions. The conservation of races asks what it is to be part of the Negro race, while the study of the Negro problems asks about the nature of the social problems involving that race. At the beginning of Strivings of the Negro People, Du Bois claims that many times when interacting with white interlocutors, there is an unasked question underlying the awkwardness of the interaction. That question is, how does it feel to be a problem? This question provides a different way into the subject matter of the other two essays. Strivings of the Negro People shifts focus away from an external anthropological or sociological point of view and turns to the psychological issue of what it feels like to be a part of this race under the social conditions of being a problem. Du Bois famously reveals in the essay when he first realized that he was a problem. Back in Great Barrington, he and his classmates were playing a game involving the exchange of visiting cards when a tall newcomer to the class refused his card, refused it preemptorily with a glance. Recounting his experience of this moment, Du Bois introduces a metaphor he would use often in upcoming work, the metaphor of the veil. He writes, then it dawned upon me with a certain suddenness that I was different from the others, or like, mayhap, in heart and life and longing, but shut out from their world by a vast veil. This way of evoking invidious racial distinction captures how, as an American among Americans, the African American is not separate from America, but is nevertheless kept apart. Notice that he does not speak of a wall. The thinness of a veil or curtain captures the subtlety of his point and of the experience. Soon after this in the text comes the double consciousness passage. It begins by placing the Negro in a list of peoples different from the list of eight races in the conservation of races. He appears to be referring to the phases of world history in the German philosopher G.W.F. Hegel's lectures on the philosophy of history. Whereas Hegel claimed in these lectures that black Africans exist outside of history, Du Bois argues that in America, the race is stepping onto the world stage in a new and powerful way. Here then is the famous passage. After the Egyptian and Indian, the Greek and Roman, the Teuton and Mongolian, the Negro is a sort of seventh son, born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world, a world which yields him no self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others and measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. We need to distinguish three related but distinct concepts that Du Bois introduces here, second sight, double consciousness, and two-ness. When he says the African-American is gifted with second sight, he indicates the ability to see from a perspective different from one's own. In some circumstances, this could indeed be a gift. Unfortunately, in the context of a racist America, it is a capacity that leads to the problem of double consciousness. This is the problem of seeing oneself from another perspective that is demeaning and having this second sight so often that it dominates and to some extent overpowers healthy self-consciousness. An example of double consciousness would be a black person hearing on the news that a violent assault has been committed and hoping the culprit will not turn out to be black. If so, even though the person who committed the crime is a complete stranger, the black person in a majority white society may worry that such events reinforce stereotypes that make life harder for all black people. As for two-ness, this is not simply double consciousness under another name, but rather the conflict that results from double consciousness in light of the fact that one's self-consciousness is dominated, but not totally erased, by this outside view. From this inside view, black people are full human beings with distinctive ideals, precisely what they are not when seen from the external viewpoint. Thus there is a clash of perspectives and a clash of ideals. How can this be resolved in favor of a single and adequate perspective? Must the external viewpoint be eliminated by rejecting America itself, perhaps through emigration? Or should there be a hope of getting rid of racial difference and becoming simply and proudly American? 
Du Bois rejects both options. He writes, The history of the American Negro is the history of this strife, this longing to attain self-conscious manhood, to merge his double self into a better and truer self. In this merging, he wishes neither of the older selves to be lost. He would not Africanize America, for America has too much to teach the world and Africa. He would not bleach his Negro soul in a flood of white Americanism, for he knows that Negro blood has a message for the world. He simply wishes to make it possible for a man to be both a Negro and an American, without being cursed and spit upon by his fellows, without having the doors of opportunity closed roughly in his face. We can explain this by saying, with a bit of anachronism, that Du Bois was defending the coherence of the very term African-American. Two-ness is the feeling that the two parts of this term conflict with one another. Du Bois argues that there is no solution in trying to avoid conflict by cutting off one part or the other. To attempt to cut the American part off is misguided and ill-advised. After all, black people have been present in the United States from the very beginning of the country's development. They are familiar with the best and the worst that America has to offer, and are arguably better placed than anyone else to appreciate what is of value in the American experiment. To attempt to cut off the African part would be equally wrong, though. It would be a tragic case of suppressing difference when it is precisely that difference that ought to be appreciated as a fruitful contribution both to America and to the world as a whole. We will have more to say in coming episodes about the gift of black folk according to Du Bois, but we've presented enough about him for now to give you a sense of his achievements at the close of the 19th century. As for our coverage of that century, we're now able to say that it's a wrap. We're ready to move on to the next major section of this podcast series, which will be devoted to the 20th century. Before launching into that, though, we want to take stock of what we've learned. So please join Chike and me next time as we look back over the last 30 episodes or so and share some conclusions we've drawn from this era in the history of African philosophy. I'm gonna tell God all of my troubles when I get